Hello guys, welcome to the Passion series and this is part 3 of the Uvial Tract. So if you remember, we had discussed about the choroditis and um, we had discussed about the both the cases that is disseminated choroditis as well as the multifocal choroditis. So today we will be starting with this, the central choroditis. So if you look, what is central choroditis here? This is mainly affecting the central area. So what is central area in the retina? That is your posterior pole or the macular region. See, whenever I am talking about the macula or the central retina or the posterior pole, they are one and the same thing. So again, you should know this. And it may occur as a part of the disseminated uh, choroditis where you have got diffuse choroditis or it may be appearing as a alone part also. Another case of um, choroditis only is your juxtapapillary choroditis. This is also called as juxtapapillary choroditis of Jensen. This is usually oval in shape and it is occurring in the young people. So you must have seen that when we talk about certain syndromes in uveitis, like when we talk about the Fuchs heterochromic iridocyclitis, then also these syndromes are particularly common in a, a particular gender or a particular age group. So similarly, this also the juxtapapillary choroditis of Jensen, it is common in the young people uh, as the exudation is close to the disc here. Now these exudates may cover the retinal vessels and uh, they are also um, found as the diffuse vitreous opacities, even the keratic precipitates. So this is generally causing what? This is actually causing a sector like or sector shaped defect in the field of vision. The cause is obscure, the inflammation subsides leaving a patch of atrophy but recurrence may take place. So not very commonly asked but just to pass by now the important thing is actually the investigations part see uh, as you know more and more of the clinical scenarios are asked there has been a lot of emphasis on the case management now case management does not mean only the treatment part Case management means how you are actually approaching the patient, how you are uh, processing the patient, what are the investigations you are going to do, what are the DDs you are going to think and how you will approach to the final diagnosis and then the treatment is pretty simple once the diagnosis is clear. So a limited number of the known etiological factors account for a considerable proportion of cases of the uveitis. As I always say that 80-20 uh, principle always works. So most of the diseases, 80% of the diseases of the uveitis are due to 20% of the syndromes which are the known syndromes. And uh, the problem frequently arises as to which initial investigations in conjunction with the clinical findings are actually justifiable to make that uh, definite diagnosis and many a times you get such kind of a question that what should be the next step of investigation what should be the best step of investigation what should be the first step of investigation so um, you know examiner play with these words and you have to be really cautious because the same question may have three set of answers according to just change of one word next step first step or the best step so obviously you have to take a careful history and detailed ocular examination and uh, what are these things you have to take the intraocular pressure also you have to uh, examine the fundus also so based on this they have given you this flow chart and as i always say the flow charts and especially the images these two things are quite important from the person so i try to deal with every flow chart and the image which has been covered here so the investigations of the patients with different types of uveitis. So first we have the acute anterior uveitis. Mostly you have got idiopathic. So you are not going to do any investigations. But if you are suspecting, again a very important thing, the seronegative spondyloarthropathies. And if you remember, we have done a separate integrated lecture of ophthalmology with orthopedics regarding the seronegative spondyloarthropathies. If you have not seen, I'll seriously and uh, you know definitely recommend that lecture. You should see that. So what are the things we are going to do in this case? You have to do the urine for WBC, x-ray for the sacroiliac joints, ESR, C-reactive proteins and the HLA typing. So again, I think this is a very, very important thing, a high yield concept and that is from where question can directly be lifted off. 
see when you are preparing the clinical cases you have to see that the theory remains same but your way of learning becomes different you have to approach that question as a case so if any case is coming to you what are the things you can think of and what are the first investigations you will advise that patient so uh, directly from this also the question could be asked that um, whether you will do the urine for rbc or serological testing or gonioscopy or anterior antibody something like this then the second important thing is the sarcoidosis so for sarcoidosis everybody knows that it is a granulomatous disease which is basically affecting the lungs so you are going to do the chest x ray the montu test then one which is very very specific for the sarcoidosis that is your anticholinergic sprays antibodies then what are the things that you are going to do for the syphilis we are going to do the um, serological test now suppose there is a fugue heterochromic aridocyclitis so that is a kind of chronic anterior uveitis so in that case we are going to do the gonioscopy another uh, important kind uh, of the chronic anterior is your juvenile chronic arthritis so if the age is less than 16 years you are going to think about the juvenile chronic arthritis or juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and here it is positive for anti nuclear antibody so if you remember in the juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile chronic arthritis we have got two important things one is that age will be less than 16 years and second thing is that the rheumatoid factor will be negative here anti nuclear antibody will be positive rheumatoid factor will be negative and um, these are the things that will help you in the investigation then coming towards the posterior in the posterior again i have got two types one is the acute posterior another is the chronic posterior in the acute posterior we have got the toxoplasmosis again for toxoplasmosis we can do the serological testing but if it is pars planitis then we do not have anything specific yes if i have toxocariasis then again we can do the eosinophil count skin test and the ige so again you can keep on marking some of the important flow charts which are important and they can be reviewed and revisited again now coming to the treatment part treatment part of the uveitis so first starting with a general treatment so in the anterior uveitis what you have to do see the main problem in cases of the anterior uveitis was your ciliary spasm i think you will agree with me that the main problem was the ciliary muscle spasm and because ciliary muscle spasm was leading to both diminution of vision also it was leading to the diminution of um, vision as well as it was also leading to the pain so these patients are actually presenting with what they are presenting with the sudden painful diminution of vision now again you will get many times these kind of a questions where the patient is coming with the sudden painful diminution of vision and uh, the two things that you are thinking uh, is the acute anterior uveitis and second is the acute congestive glaucoma now glaucoma we know is more common um, this type of glaucoma in a female especially after 50 years of age and there are lot many things that will tell you that this is a case of glaucoma we will have colored halos uh we will have stony hard eye acute red eye we will have very very high intraocular pressure so then we also will have the mid dilatation of the pupil because here the pupil will be small meiotic or constricted in cases of uveitis so uh, usually when you have a patient of sudden painful diminution of vision keep in your mind that i have to think mainly mainly i am saying on two lines either this is a patient of acute anterior uveitis or this is a case of acute congestive glaucoma and then you will have to look for the secondary signs so now you have to differentiate this Th that is again very important because the treatment of the two is i think just the opposite in cases of glaucoma the attack comes due to the midriasis attack is due to the mid dilatation of the pupil so there you give the meiotics so for the treatment i give the pilocarpine on the other hand if i look in the uh, acute anterior uveitis where the main problem is the ciliary muscle spasm so in order to relax that ciliary muscle spasm the treatment that i give is the midriatics and the cycloplegic so you have to be very very careful treatment is just the opposite 
and if you are making a wrong diagnosis by the way you are giving just the opposite treatment so what you are going to do we have to give the midriatics and cycloplegics midriatics means we dilate the pupil cycloplegics means i am paralyzing the ciliary muscle so in a short way i can say in by both the things i am relieving we give relief of the we give the relief to the ciliary muscle spasm by both the things i am relieving that ciliary muscle spasm so whatever was the you know blurring of vision that was due to the ciliary muscle spasm whatever was the amount of the pain and discomfort that was occurring due to this both are relieved okay so this we are giving twice or thrice daily and control of the acute phases of inflammation also we are giving the steroids they are essentials for the local treatment so two things are important one is your midriatics and cycloplegics and second is the steroids now uh, again a million dollar question always uh, there is a uh, some controversy that whether midriatics and cycloplegics are the treatment of choice or steroids are the treatment of choice and many of the uh, platforms says that or uh, many of the books also says that the steroids are the treatment of choice see no doubt you have to give steroids because steroids are acting by three mechanisms of actions uh, what are the things it is anti inflammatory okay and um, then it is also anti allergic anti allergic and then it is also anti fibrotic so we have got three mechanisms of action by which the steroids are acting inflammatory obviously it's inflammatory disease allergic the most common etiology of the uveitis is autoimmune or uh, the allergic etiology and if i talk about the cyanic and adhesions it is fibrosis so obviously steroids are important but if the midriatics and cycloplegics are given in the option they should be considered to be better than the steroids as the treatment of choice because steroids will lead to a lot of side effects also we all know about the gtcs topical steroids leads most commonly to the glaucoma systemic steroids leads most commonly to the cataract and obviously if you are giving topical steroids yourself in the treatment of uveitis you cannot uh, you know um, say no to the fact that these patients will be vulnerable and predisposed towards the glaucoma plus if you are giving the systemic steroids again the patient can have cataract so there is a limit to which i can give the steroids i will have to taper down second important thing is that the main problem of the uveitis that was actually the ciliary muscle spasm is not directly relieved by the steroids so uh, we always decide the treatment of the choice based on the fact that what was the main problem so here main problem was the ciliary muscle spasm that was leading to the sudden painful diminution of vision and that is also again a very important reason why i am not considering steroids to be the first choice it is the midriatics and cycloplegics because they are relieving the ciliary muscle spasm they are breaking the posterior synecy they are preventing the posterior synecy they are also decreasing the vascular permeability and thereby decreasing the exudation so all these things actually um, gives you the reason that these are considered to be the treatment of choice and not the steroids obviously if you do not have midriatics and cycloplegics in the option then the second best will be your steroids okay now the cycloplegics what are uh, the mechanism of action so we have already discussed this they are they are keeping the iris and ciliary body at rest so they are giving relief to the ciliary muscle spasm they are diminishing the hyperemia they are decreasing the vascular permeability they are preventing the formation of posterior synecy they are also breaking the synecy so obviously these are the treatment of choice okay now second is your corticosteroids so corticosteroids are given as topical drops also ointment also even the sub -con uh, conjunctival injections all these are given especially in the acute phase when the amount of inflammation is really very very high and you need to prevent that inflammation you have to restrict that inflammation at any cost potent corticosteroids what are the steroids that we can use the good ones the betamethasone dexamethasone prednisolone so they are used in full strength see you will also have to see which steroids are being used like for example uh, you know about the vkc the allergic conjunctivitis there also we give the topical steroids but there the amount of inflammation is not very high so there we are giving just the fluoromethylone fluoromethylone uh, is the most uh, weak one this is the weakest in terms of the fakc also and in terms of the 
adverse reactions also so there i am giving that but here the amount of inflammation is very very high so here i am giving the betamethasone dexamethasone prednisolone and then they can be given in the diluted form then they are given in 1 is to 10 dilution or they can be uh, given with the fluoromethylone or medriceron drops which are actually having the weaker potency which are less likely to raise the intraocular pressure if the uveitis is severe and it is not responding to the topical steroids only when it's not responding to the topical steroids you can also give the periocular steroids in the form of methylprednisolone or triamcinolone this will be injected in the subtenon space ideally before injecting the steroid drops it is wise to use full strength topical steroids for six weeks to ensure that the patient is not a steroid responder see everybody knows that steroids are always a double-edged sword so we always have this problem that whenever we need steroids to use you will have to actually follow up for its uh, side effects so it is always advised that if you feel that you may have to give the periocular steroids and topical steroids are really not working that fine. So you will have to first give the full dose of topical steroids in order to find out whether or not patient is a steroid responder. Uh, I hope you know what is steroid responder. See, every person who is being given steroids will not uh, show you the raised intraocular pressure. Only 5%, it's only the... 5% of the people who are actually the high steroid responders. Rest are either the moderate uh, steroid responders or it's the just the low steroid responder. So you will have to see whether your patient is a steroid responder or not and whether or not this patient will develop the um, raised intraocular pressure after giving the steroids. Occasionally the results are dramatic and eye becomes white with great rapidity but sometimes improvement is slow and then you will have to give even the systemic steroids now what are the common indications for the steroid therapy common indications again you can get a direct question from here what are the common indications for the steroid therapy we have got a severe uveitis or if you are not getting uh, improvement even with the maximal topical or repository steroids the systemic administration of corticosteroids cut short and at um, an attack and hastens the healing so if you are having very very severe uveitis or you are not getting improvement even after giving the uh, full dose of the topical steroids then we can give the systemic steroids okay now sometimes you may also have to give the systemic immunosuppressive drugs or immune modulating drugs obviously you have to look for the cost benefit ratio because i think in covid times everybody knows that what is the actually problem when you are start giving the immunosuppressive drugs and a number of the uh, other secondary bacterial and fungal infections can also take place so you may think about the methotrexate cyclophosphamide cyclosporin some cases which are not responding to the steroid therapy only then we are giving otherwise it's not needed and uh, a very important thing is that they should always be administered in conjunction with the internist or the rheumatologist so don't just uh, start these drugs on your own okay always in the um, in the uh, uh, in vigilance of a rheumatologist or the internist uh, that we have to give these drugs now uh, apart from this we also have to give some specific treatment because you know that most common etiology of the uveitis is some autoimmune disease some allergic etiology so obviously some sort of treatment should be given for this um, systemic uh, etiology also the particular disease that the patient is having due to which he or she is showing you uveitis for example if you are dealing with a case of the Ritter syndrome if urethritis is present the patient as well as the partner should be treated for the chlamydial infection so you will have to uh, give the treatment to both the partners then we can have the lens induced uveitis so that will require the removal of the lens if the patient is having the Bechet syndrome then it will need the systemic steroids and the immunosuppressors if the patient is having syphilis then we will give penicillin and tuberculosis uh, may the patient has to be given the ATT so I think again this uh, para will again give you uh, a uh, uh, good insight in solving the clinical case scenario suppose um, a patient is coming to you and they have defined you whole of the case scenario with respect to the syphilis 
or the Ritter syndrome or the Bichette syndrome, then you will have to say that I will treat the uveitis and I will also give the, um, support, the supportive treatment along with the causative treatment. So both of them, sometimes they give what, uh, what all options are given, one only, one and two, one, two and three, one, two, three, four. So you will have to see. So if it's a syphilis, you have to give the penicillin. If it is tuberculosis, you have to give the ATT also. So it is a combined thing that will be your treatment of choice. Okay. Now, another important thing is that we also have number of sequelae and the complications in uveitis. So, your treatment is not complete before treating the sequelae and the complications. And the first important thing is your secondary glaucoma. Secondary glaucoma is again very, very important in cases of the uveitis because we have elevation of the IOP in cases of uveitis by so many roots. Whenever we have, you know, acute inflammation, these inflammatory cells are released, they'll go to the trabecular meshwork, they'll cause the blockade of the trabecular meshwork and you will have rise of intraocular pressure then we will also have the sinuses adhesions posterior sinuses we have seen the pathogenesis and pathophysiology of the glaucoma due to the ring sinuses how do do we have the iris bombay formation that leads to the um, uh, this uh, aqueous collection behind the lens and we have got uh, this um, uh, acute angle closure glaucoma that can lead to even the peripheral anterior sinuses and even the chronic uh, congestive glaucoma then we are also giving the topical steroids now these steroids especially in the those people who are high steroid responders can again lead to the uh, glaucoma so obviously there are so many mechanisms by which a person who is having the uveitis can develop the glaucoma so it's very very important if it develops uh, before or uh, posterior or peripheral sinuses the most effective form is to intensify the atropinization and use the corticosteroids to allay the inflammatory congestion and what they are saying suppose glaucoma is occurring even before the development of the sinuses now till now sinuses is not there we do not have peripheral sinuses we do not have posterior sinuses then what are the things you have you have to give you need to give the atropine as well as the steroids right then uh, the second thing is your corticosteroids, aqueous suppressants such as beta blockers are given topically and uh, acetazolamide given systemically very frequently very useful in such cases. So you are giving the atropine also, you are giving steroids also plus you are giving the beta blockers also. So all these three things are the topical one, topical midriatics and cycloplegics, topical steroids and topical beta blockers we are giving. Along with this, if it is required, you can also use the anti-glaucoma drug, which is systemic, that is your acetazolamide. Now, an uh, important thing here, you always have to avoid pilocarpine and latinoprost are contraindicated as uveitis may be exacerbated. So if you remember again a point where you need to differentiate whether this acute anterior, it is acute anterior uveitis or it is acute congestive glaucoma whether this sudden painful diminution of vision is due to uveitis or due to the angle closure glaucoma is again very important because uh, if you see pilocarpine is the drug of choice in cases of angle closure glaucoma why here it has to be avoided or it is contraindicated so always the treatments are opposite of each other so you have to be very very clear that the question which uh, is portrayed in front of you with the sudden painful diminution of vision is actually your acute congestive glaucoma or it is the acute anterior uveitis. Uh, talking about the laser treatment, the laser iridotomy is essential in all the cases, especially with the annular sinuses, because you have to, you know, resume the connection between the two chambers. So, uh, due to the iris bombay formation, if you uh, remember, it was something like this, and uh, normally iris was uh, like this, and we were having the ciliary body and we were having the lens right it was something like this now here what we were having due to the annular sinuses so due to the annular sinuses what is happening suppose uh, this is your iris so the pupillary edge of this iris is coming and it is getting adhesion on the anterior surface of the lens here due to which the aqueous is collecting here do you remember this this is the most important part of your ring sinuses so it was something like this and due to this now it is pushing this iris anteriorly and this iris is becoming like this so i'll draw the other one here so it is becoming something like this this is the lens here and this iris is going anteriorly and it is ballooning this something like this and something like this here 
so what is happening we have aqueous collection here also and we have aqueous collection here also so now this aqueous is not able to go anteriorly so there is no connection between this posterior chamber and this anterior chamber so if you are creating an opening in this iris so through this we can have a connection between the posterior chamber and the anterior chamber now once it comes in the anterior chamber it can go at the angles and it can go through the trabecular meshwork also so that is the reason why the laser iridotomy is so so important here all such procedures however must be avoided but these procedures should be avoided during the acute attack of iritis since the traumatic iritis setup will frustrate the aim of operation by filling the opening with the exudate so again this is important you have to do this but don't do this during the acute attack because as soon as you open that opening will be crumbled up by the exudation and your whole purpose of giving that opening will be failed it is best to uh, 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 it is best if possible to forestall a ring sinecki by performing the iridectomy during a quiescent interval before the adhesions extends the entire around the entire circle so you will have to wait for a period when everything is silent and you have a quiescent period where acute inflammation is not there only then it's better to create this opening other complications again a very important list other complications apart from secondary glaucoma are the cataract band shape keratopathy cystoid macular edema so um, all those people who you know always have a confusion that what are the complications of the uveitis so secondary glaucoma is the most important one then we have a cataract what kind of cataract the complicated cataract we have band shape keratopathy and we have cystoid macular edema now this cataract can be uh, removed after the uveitis has been questioned for at least two to three months so again an important thing when should you treat this cataract at least after two to three months band shape keratopathy may we can do the ptk phototherapeutic keratin to me or you can also do the chelation therapy by edta so same as for any band shape keratopathy so this was about the uveitis now we come to the purulent form of uveitis the purulent form of uveitis that is your endophthalmitis and panophthalmitis so first of all talking about the etiology now etiology could be exogenous or it could be endogenous so whenever we are having infections it could be coming up from outside or it can be creeping in from the inner aspect only so first of all talking about the exogenous if you talk about the purulent exogenous uveitis it is generally by the infected wounds it could be or it could be from uh, the ocular surgery or any corneal ulcer so if there is an infected wound then it is coming inside penetrating trauma it could be or it could be due to the complication of ocular surgery or due to the breakdown of or perforation of the corneal ulcer in case of the ulcer the when then and when the penetrating wound is corneal the inflammation can also remain as anterior uveitis but sometimes when it is very very virulent and whole of the eye is involved then it can be as a pan of thalmitis now when we have the deeper injuries and it is going inside so when it is going inside then it is first of all the vitreous which is affected first so it is the internal part see what is the difference between end of thalmitis and pan of thalmitis try to understand this this is your eyeball right and uh, this is your sclera this portion is your sclera and this portion is the cornea and then we have the inner coat as i always say this middle coat i draw with the red color so this is your middle coat the choroid and then we have got the retina so i'll draw the retina also blue color so we have got this one and this one this is ora serrata and we are going backwards and this is your retina which is continuing to form this optic nerve also then we'll draw the lens also yeah so this is your retina and then we go for this um, lens okay now suppose the inflammation is occurring and uh, it is entering and then it is first affecting this vitreous area so what is happening due to this the inflammation uh, i am using this orange color to show the inflammation it is uh, having the inflammation in the inner coats of the eyeball so when i am having this inflammation in the inner coats of the eyeball what is there the sclera is actually spared so sclera is spared if the sclera is spared that means only the inner coats are involved then i say that this is a case of the endophthalmitis then this is a case of endophthalmitis where the sclera is spared and 
what is happening we know that the extraocular muscles are actually inserted over this sclera so obviously if the sclera is spared then these extraocular muscles are also spared if extraocular muscles are spared that means if i talk about the ocular motility so if i talk about the ocular motility then this is also spared that is the main difference between the end of thelmitis and the pan of thelmitis now pan means hole so what does this mean if i have pan of thelmitis then that means hole of the eyeball is involved so if hole of the eyeball is involved that means sclera is also involved and if the sclera is also involved that means extraocular muscles will be affected and therefore the ocular motility will also be affected so clinically also i can easily differentiate whether this is a case of and of thelmitis or pan of thelmitis by looking at the ocular motility right okay so end of thelmitis look at the definition end of thelmitis is defined as the intraocular inflammation where the which is predominantly affecting the inner spaces of the eye and its content that is the vitreous and the anterior chamber though so sclera is spared uh, organisms which are responsible for the bacterial end of thelmitis may we have pneumococcus we have staph both staph aureus staph epidermidis streptococci e coli pseudomonas bacillus cereus subtilis clostridium welshi again a important group because many a times we get question on end of thelmitis end of thelmitis is the most severe complication of the cataract surgery we have early onset bacterial end of thelmitis we have late onset bacterial end of thelmitis so we get to know what are the things uh, can be there what are the organisms that can be involved so you should know the names of the bacteria which are usually involved in the end of thelmitis we we'll look at the table also and the anaerobic now if you look at a uh, typical type of end of thelmitis which is caused by anaerobic propionibacterium acnes then that should be considered as a cause in all patients who are having low grade and relapsing end of thelmitis so again this line will help you in solving a particular question where they have given you, you a case uh, uh, of low grade and the relapsing kind of end of thelmitis so all, uh, you have to think about the propionibacterium acnes um talking about the fungal end of thelmitis so fungal end of thelmitis usually occurs after the intraocular surgery or whenever we have trauma with the vegetative matter such as thorn and wooden stick so i think this is easy because you already know that whenever we have fungal infection we have history of some vegetative trauma that could be a animal matter that could be a plant matter same goes with the fungal corneal ulcers so fungal end of thelmitis have a long incubation period of several weeks predominantly it is affecting the anterior vitreous and anterior uvea and hypopion is always there the vitreous becomes a granuloma and pupil becomes occluded with the inflammatory material so again uh, important evidence is to find out whether it's a uh, acute end of thelmitis or the relapsing end of thelmitis or it's a uh, uh, late onset end of thelmitis something like this so see i told you we'll look at the table and again an important table where you have to see what are the common organisms causing the end of thelmitis so you can see here we have got the exogenous end of thelmitis we have got delayed onset end of thelmitis we have post traumatic end of thelmitis and endogenous end of thelmitis now uh, obviously whole of the table uh, sometimes become difficult to remember so i would say at least learn one one the first most common one so in cases of the acute post operative so uh, i think you remember in cases of the cataract surgery i told you that it is a acute post operative which is caused by the staph epidermidis this one then the delayed onset bacteria may it's the propionibacterium acnes fungus may you can remember the aspergillus and fusarium the same as that of your fungal corneal ulcer so you can easily remember post traumatic may it is the bacillus cereus and endogenous especially the iv drug abusers again bacillus so at least remember these one one if you are able to learn more than this then then that is well and good but at least you have to learn the first most common one okay now the delayed onset exogenous end of thelmitis can occur after the cataract surgery it can occur after the glaucoma filtering surgery also and uh, when they are occurring after these surgeries they are clearly saying that it is a fungus as well as the propionibacterium acnes is the most common likely organisms in the end of thelmitis which are occurring several weeks or months after the cataract surgery so you know that in late onset uh, bacterial end of thelmitis after the cataract surgery it was the propionibacterium acnes 
now looking at the endogenous causes so endogenous cause may mainly it is metastatic uh, in origin such cases could be occurring as a complication of the infection from some other place like we can have meningococcal septicemia or it could be people having these um, steroids immunosuppressives those having the hiv uh, obviously this infection could be again bacterial fungal or viral and see uh, this is an important sentence I think again in this COVID crisis mucor mycosis extends directly from the nasopharynx in debilitated individuals with the diabetic ketoacidosis so very recently I gave you one video about the orbital mucormycosis one uh, was your rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis then we i told you about the fungal infections of the orbit with respect to the mucormycosis also and i discussed all the risk factors so i told you why it's common in diabetic ketoacidosis because the acidic environment is dysregulating the phagocytic response and um, it is also decreasing the iron binding capacity that is why the free iron is available more and this free iron could be used by this mucor for its growth in virulence so that is why it can be coming directly from the nasopharynx and uh, it is very very common in cases of your diabetic ketoacidosis okay now coming to the clinical features what are the important things you have to look in order to diagnose the endophthalmitis you have to see the pain the swelling of the eyelid diminution of vision and again a high index of suspicion especially in the post-operative cases i think i regularly say keep on reminding you this that the eye sees only what the mind knows so in all the post-operative cases definitely you have to keep a high degree of suspicion uh, of the endophthalmitis in your mind in order to make the early diagnosis and the treatment in differentiating the endophthalmitis from post-operative sterile inflammation you will have to see that if there is uh, two things if you have pain and you have diminution of vision then the possibility of infection are very very high always look for them and uh, if you are having some doubt see they, we can have a doubt uh, whether it is uh, the infection or whether it is the inflammation and many a times you know picture is so confusing and so similar that you are not able to get you have to concentrate on two things look at the pain look at the diminution of vision and even then if you have a confusion do the careful examination and observation at least for six to eight hours and if there is a rapid worsening then that, uh, certainly it shows that it is an infection the um, cases of the inflammation will not be worsening so suddenly and so acutely so if there is a constant worsening always evidence will go or diagnosis will go towards the infection now in both the cases of your endogenous as well as exogenous endophthalmitis there could be you know a fever headache sometimes vomiting and fever especially more common with endogenous infection metastaticness systemic features appear late in cases of the exogenous infection systemic features will come late but if it is endogenous fever is more common okay and uh, if you are having the systemic features coming late uh, as in cases of exogenous infection they are usually indicating that the infection is going outside the eyeball outside means sclera is involved sclera is involved means panophthalmitis and it can even progress to orbital cellulitis and orbital cellulitis can progress to the cavernous sinus thrombosis also yes now in the exogenous form the edges of the wound will be or yellow and necrotic hypopion will come there will be uh, severe chemosis with the ciliary and conjunctival congestion lids are also swollen we have a lot of exudation in the vitreous cavity you will have um, purulent endophthalmitis and you will get a yellowish fundus reflex the whitish pupillary reflex would also be there the anterior chamber becomes full of pus cloudy cornea yellow ring of infiltration corneal melting means condition is by far very very poor in cases of exogenous form everywhere you can see pus in exudates there may be even proptosis and uh, as i told you before also because it is a pan of thalmitis so muscles are also involved motility is also affected a proptosis is also there so all this case uh, means we also have the painful movement of the eyeball so motility is painful also 
we have tenderness also at the insertion of the muscles we have proptosis also we have cellulitis also we have hypopions we have pus we have uh, balls of uh, exudates floating in the vitreous cavity and we have totally panophthalmitis and if it's not adequately treated it may go to the orbital cellulitis and cavernous sinus thrombosis as i say so picture is you know really uh, very very gloomy and you will have to see that seriously a small uh, infection which started with endophthalmitis moving to panophthalmitis to proptosis to painful motility to orbital cellulitis can lead to a ophthalmic emergency that is your cavernous sinus thrombosis okay so this is a picture of the endophthalmitis in the um, metastatic cases it could be showing the hazy media and uh, we have a yellowish reflex so you all know that uh, in the dd of leukocoria we always keep this endophthalmitis as one of the options and uh, there could be hypopion there will be rapid failure of vision so whenever in the ward this such kind of patients are admitted always you have to inform them that they should be very very careful if there is any diminution of vision even staff should be advised about that and the patient should not be careless if there is a pain and diminution of vision in the post operative cases after initial improvement of the vision then in the severe cases inflammation may rise to widespread formation of cyclitic membranes could be there now if you have membranes in the region of the ciliary body there could be destruction of ciliary processes and due to that you will have hypotony diminution of the ocular pressure and uh, eyeball will start Start becoming very very small. In the most severe cases, the infection is allowed to take its natural course, and the pus will burst out of the walls of the globe. And then the pain can subside also. The condition is not likely to set up uh, the sympathetic ophthalmitis. So again, this could be a question here. that if it is going to form you know cyclitic membranes and there is hypotony there is shrinking then we are not getting this sympathetic ophthalmitis so what are the things that you need to do you have to take a detailed history examination you have to do the ultrasonography to confirm the diagnosis why how will you confirm the diagnosis by looking at the exudates in the vitreous cavity then sometimes you may also need to do the vitreous tap or biopsy why because i need i need to know what kind of infection it is so i can send it for the biopsy i can uh, send it for the culture the gram staining the gems are staining uh, you can do culture koh mount koh we do for the fungal element so this uh, para is again very important which will tell you how to go about the diagnosis of this end of thelmitis you have to do the vitreous tap you have to do the biopsy see end of thelmitis is all, uh, always a important topic because it's a great ophthalmic emergency especially after the cataract surgery which is the most common intraocular surgery so these kind of people need to go for the vitreous tap you do the gem staining gram staining you are also sending it for the culture because uh, fungal end of thelmitis could also be there then you have to do your um, complete uh, blood count you have to see the fasting blood glucose you have to see the serum electrolytes all these things have to be seen because you have to start the antibiotic because there is a infection so you have to give the antibiotics by all the possible routes then we have to do the anterior chamber and vitreous taps should be performed at once and samples inoculated into the blood and the chocolate agar so again these taps uh, which are done they are inoculated on both the uh, plates simultaneously the blood agar the chocolate agar even we are using the sabarauds uh, medium for the fungi thioglycolate for the anaerobes and after a vitreous tap we give a single injection of antibiotics with or without dexamethasone is given directly into the vitreous cavity so again we will be elaborating on this that whether we should give steroids or not again we have got two school of thoughts on giving the steroids because you know steroids is one thing uh, which has always a double edged sword so this is a case of end of the mitis where you have got lot of suppression lot of purulent uh, inflammation is there and side by side you have uh, the uh, in inflammation so when i have purulent inflammation we are always confused whether to give the steroids or not and um, that is why you know there is two school of thought but most of the ophthalmologists prefer to give the steroids in order to subside the inflammation and uh, so that uh, we can uh, you know taper it off and once the inflammation subside uh, we can uh, you know taper them and uh, we can even stop the steroids so if you go to the treatment part to achieve the best results it is essential that all cases empirically on the basis of the sphere examination 
with a suitable combination of broad spectrum antibiotics and steroids are given from the beginning so by far, uh, far and large uh, empirically only we start the treatment we are not waiting for that long because uh, even if you are waiting for that long then it can go and progress to a very severe variety so we start with the broad spectrum antibiotics by um, almost all the routes and we also give the steroids in majority of the cases bacteriological diagnosis is not possible exactly and treatment is empirical the cardinal prerequisite to the successful therapy is a suitable selection of the antibiotics and the use of broad spectrum antibiotics antibiotics every route as i say every route of administration should be used in order to maintain a high intraocular concentration of antibiotics throughout the treatment and that is the reason we um, usually prefer cephalosporins and vancomycin again uh, you can go uh, according to your uh, preference and uh, according to your experience whatever is there but mostly we are using the broad spectrum antibiotics so this is a uh, roughly about the treatment of the end of thelmitis and uh, this is all for today i think uh, we have dealt with some of the important things basically today's lecture was very very clinical about the uveitis where we tried to investigate the case what are the things we should investigate and how we should proceed for the treatment what are the kind of treatment we have to give uh, the supportive treatment as well as the causative treatment and then we have tried to look at the separative aspects of the uveitis both the end of thelmitis and pan of thelmitis along with a glimpse on the start of the treatment for end of thelmitis so we will do uh, further discussions as far as the treatment is concerned in the next turn and i hope uh, you enjoyed the session of this uveitis as much as i did and for any queries uh, um, uh, i'm always there and you can always send me your queries and uh, also give me the feedback about the sessions on the parson series because i also require a lot of motivation in doing this parson series thank you and happy ophthalmology thank you and happy ophthalmology